The Coral Rock is that was, that was great. The, the team they give me the opportunity to to establish myself at the big league level, and I mean I, I mean I'm, I'm very thankful to this organization, man. I'm still working for them, and uh, I love it, man. And you know, and playing with these guys along my career, man, that was a that was a great experience. Everyone, I mean, you got Larry, Hall of Famer, uh, the best player I ever played with, and he got all the real, real fine tools. Uh, Dante, man, the great hitter, clutch hitter, and uh, I know Ellis, man, one of the, another five tool player, man, can do it all. Uh, and uh, you know, it was, it was a great experience for me to uh, to be around them and learn a lot from them. That was that was an unbelievable experience for me. Then who was the first guy that said that you could do something? Dante. <laughs> 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 right? What about you, Dante? Uh, a defining moment, what did you say? Early, yeah, an early one that kind of defined the club for you. Boy, you know, I, I'm in the same situation with Vinny. We, these guys came, they were players. We were kind of trying to uh, establish, and, and um, a lot of people think I was in the expansion draft. I was actually traded for, mm -hmm. and I remember the, 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 they, they uh, said, who do you want in the draft that we can tra draft? And I think Baylor was the reason I got here. Who do you want in this expansion draft that we can trade you to Chef for? And I think it was, I forget the guy's name, the big left handed power. But I got here. But I think the first moment that really was probably the first time uh, Jerry McMorris spoke to the team and, uh, you know, talked about, you know, the dreams and everything. And, and, and it's all here for you guys. <coughs> These fans are, you're going to be stunned at the fans. And, the, and we were like 83,000, I think, opening mm -hmm. day. And, I didn't think we any of us kind of thought that was coming, and uh, it did, and it was crazy, and it was. We played, and it's gonna be tough to ever beat that error because yeah. of just how many people showed up and were just they were just excited to have us. Yeah. I think for the first two years they cheered on, you know, pop ups. You know, yeah, they, yeah. Were, they just loved us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think it was that speech speech that Jerry McMorris gave that day, and uh, and uh, that just was kind of like, oh wow, this is got a chance to be. Yeah. Larry. Yeah. Um, for me, one's in a, there are two situations that happened. One was in an expo uniform, when, as Dante just touched on, when you step into a ballpark and there's 80 some odd thousand people uh, for a baseball game at a football field. You know, that was, coming as a visitor, that was uh, quite special for me. Uh, and then the first year in a Rocky uniform, the, the one moment that always stands up in my head is middle April 14th inning, and you see that fist pump of a game-winning home run. Yeah. That, 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 that stands out and kind of started the season. It was game one, and here we go. I, go, oh, I made the right decision, so yeah. it was a, that was pretty cool for me. All right. And Ellis? Well, for me coming over, you know, as a free agent and signing with the Rockies, uh, you know, in 94, uh, first season here for me, I thought it was going to be a hell of an offensive club. I knew that right away. It was just a matter of uh, you know, where I was going to hit because I was with you know, Vinny. You know, there was all kinds of guys on the club. Yeah, eight, you? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I knew we were going to score runs. I knew we were going to be a team that you know, was going to be reckoned with. But also, the key was the pitching. If we could get the pitching to match that offense, and you know, of course, we had guys they spot start here and there. But I knew it was going to be a great club. I was excited to be a part of something new. Of course, they were here in the inaugural season in 93, but it was still fairly new. Um, and like they all said, uh, the fans. I mean, you know, in Mile High State, you're looking at 75,000 fans. I've never seen anything like that in a game, breaking records in, in just series alone. So it was some excitement and uh, always something new, but I was looking forward to that, the challenge. All right, thank you. Rockies fans obviously adore you guys. You still talk about the Blake Street Bombers. When Larry got into the Hall of Fame, did it feel like the Bombers were being acknowledged at least on a national level by Major League Baseball and by the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown? I thought that was one of the best things for the Rockies to have the, the first Hall of Famer. And it happened to be Larry, it was unbelievable. Congratulations all the way around with that. He's an unbelievable player and uh, nothing but respect for him and what he's done. But as far as the whole city and this region, I thought it was perfect because, of course, we're going to have another one coming up soon, hopefully with Hot. But uh, I thought it was perfect, perfect timing for the Rockies and the fans. So, yeah, it, I thought it was a good thing. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, 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 
when I was, I, I kind of, I did a lot of interviews. I talked more about Larry for a freaking year than anybody <laughs> <laughs> after that. And you know what, I was, I was really pumped for him because, yeah, we, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the course field thing. And, uh, and I think a lot of people when I talked to them said, oh, I didn't know that. And I think a big push that helped him is, is how his ex-teammates talked about it because I can tell you personally I played with Griffey Jr. I played with some really really good players I never played anybody could do everything like this guy could do I mean he could do everything better than anybody in person basically run the bases better play defense if he wanted to freaking win a batting title that was there one of freaking hit home runs that was there it was crazy and it was it's, I think it's great for Colorado to have that in, in their in the books I, I, I think for, for everybody in the organization, for everybody, all the, all the guys that, that play with Larry, we are very, very excited and happy for him in the, the, the organization. The first Hall of Famer, man, that the fans and here love him, and uh, he got the chance to watch him play every day, man, and share the game with, with, uh, with us first, and then with the, with the, with the, with the fans. I mean, that was unbelievable experience for, for us all. When, he was when they put him in the Hall of Fame. I was, I mean, I was very happy and excited for him and, and for everybody here. I mean, obviously for his family, and friends, but uh, for the whole city of Denver and for all the players that we played with him. And I was looking forward to the speech. Got delayed for a year. I must have ripped that sheet up a hundred times and started over a hundred times. <laughs> Question for all you guys: The Rockies are trying to find their way back to a winning path right now. We debate all the time: Should they go back to some <coughs> kind of Blake Street Bomber type offense? If you know, a lot of big money involved, of course, to bring guys like you in. But is that something you think could work here to just make this a place where the offense just scares the other team to death? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, anytime you can put up. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten runs a game that you should do pretty good. But then, of course, if you're giving up eight, nine, ten, eleven runs a game, uh, you know, you're kind of chasing your tail. But um, I, I think, you know, I was speaking earlier today to someone about the the farm system because you, know, you just can't go out and and purchase you know, a ton of money on players or trade off a lot because then you're, you know, you're left dry. So I think, you know, the farm system needs to be built a little bit too to to have that uh, pool that you can go grab some good players on that can come on up. So I think they're, they're they're perhaps running a little thin right now in that department. So, and and that you know that's a that's a process that's got to start, and it, it doesn't happen you know over a couple of years. It's, it takes some time. You know, and that's exactly the point I was going to make as far as the minor league system is concerned, especially with the pitching aspect. You know, you look at the organization itself, and the key pitchers in the past ten years have been homegrown talent. You're not going to get a lot of free agents to come in here unless you overpay them, like you've done a couple of times before and it didn't pan out. So you definitely have to stock up at the minor league level on the pitching side first, and then the hitters, you know, you can actually go get a free agent hitter. You know, either a big bopper in the infield, big bopper in the outfield. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it starts with pitching though. To, yeah, to me, uh, this was, I've thought about this a million times, but um, <laughs> I think, yeah, you're right on it. The Blake Street Bombers, that 95 team is to me is a good mold to start from because if you look at that bullpen, it was a bunch of guys that were really, I mean, you got to give Gebhardt a freaking credit because he pulled out Ruffin out of nowhere and was scanning. And, and we had Steve Reed from here. We had all kind of funky arms and they, they and, 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 and the character, not so much character, but just the, like Kevin Ritz was a perfect one. He just didn't care about his stats. That's a big one here because if you're trying to win Cy Young here, this is not the place to pitch, right? So you got to get a veteran like Kevin Ritz. He's a Dante. I remember Kevin Ritz throwing inside. He said, Dante, I'm going to throw inside. And I'm going to throw inside. And if they hit it out of the park, I'm going to throw inside. And he didn't get scared. And he wasn't worried about it. He said, I, I, you know, he won 17 games for us with a four something ERA. And, and then that bullpen, and they were really, really good. I mean, Laskanik and was really good, rough, and, and then offensively, yes, you got to bully teams at home. You got to get teams, and it's not so much you know you hear a lot about get some fly ball hitters. None of us were fly ball hitters. 
we were all line drive hitters. You put good line drive hitters with bat speed in this park, and all of a sudden, it really, those, that really is what blows up in this park. So I think fly ball hitters, once they hit fly balls, they're out any park. No, a big league park is not tough to hit a home run in, you know? Um, so I just think you get a bunch of good hitters, they'll blow up in this park, and then you'll have something that you bully teams at home. That's my, sorry, too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with all these guys about that. We, uh, we have, uh, you know, in 95, like that, you say, uh, you have a murder rule on a line mark. And, uh, and we uh, outscore people, you know, we don't have the pitching. I was uh, talking in the Spanish radio yesterday about, uh, they asked me, well, what if you guys, that line up, because we, we, we can hit plus the team can run too and play a good defense too. So uh, they asked me, well, you guys have uh, De La Rosa, Duvaldo Jimenez, Herman, and that team. I said, man, <laughs> we uh, probably, we, we win. And, and then with that, with, all the lineup we have, and I think this is this ballpark is for, for the score runs and have some guys that can that can scare people, man. I mean, I remember uh, when uh, usually the last group hit on the team stretching, and uh, we, we started yelling, ERA, ERA, because there's some guys, they, they scared to come in. And, uh, and, so, uh, I mean, that, that, that's going to help a lot, man. Dante, and uh, talking about the 95 team, I, I kind of always felt the kind of year you had in 95, but the uh, reputation of course feels that anybody could hit. And so I think your your statistics were kind of downgraded when they gave the most valuable player to Larkin. How did you feel about that that year? Yeah, that was kind of a statement, hey, we're not gonna give an MVP to the, the juiced up standing. And I didn't help myself out because I don't know if you remember, I didn't hit a home run on the road in the first half. And I didn't even know that. And I had 16 homers at home or something. And then somebody told me, and I remember Baylor, Baylor said, hey, I want you to talk to this, this sports psychologist over here. And I was like, all right, after BP, I was like, all right, all right, I'll talk to him for you. I'd do anything for Don Baylor. And I forgot, I forgot the guy was there after BP and I never talked to the guy. And the next game on the road, I was like, all right, I'm hitting home. And I hit a homer and I actually, I think, Led or tied Mike Piazza for most homers on the road in the second half, and, but it wasn't enough. And uh, he took care of that the next year, though. And uh, and then him the freaking year after that, I think they all they, all three of us had like 40 and 340, and I think Larry hit like 480 or something. But. <laughs> <laughs> this has always been considered a young franchise, and maybe you're still with the organization. All of you have worked with it um, at some point in the past. How important is it to reach out to you guys and make you a part of what's going on now? And uh, you know, Denny, Larry, all of you, just answer that one. I mean, I'm, I'm still I'm still working for the organization, and uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see the young the young guys come and ask me questions, and I'll be able to, to answer, and, and they uh, want to hear something about what we do in our, our routine and stuff, or even the uh, the front office, some uh, they come and say, "Hey, you guys, how you do this? How you guys do that?" And, you know, that's uh, that's good. The the, uh, the the young the young kids uh, come and approach us because we, we have some success here. Not only here, but the, I mean, everybody plays different ball clubs and have success too, and then in another ball club. And, uh, but that's uh, that's I, I feel I feel good when uh, when I can share with. The young players, man, with, um, and through my career, what I learned through my career, man, and, and, that's, and I and I enjoy doing that too. Um, I've never, I don't, I don't do much coaching. I don't, I, I don't know how to translate what I did verbally to to people. I don't, I, I don't know how to uh, tell them how to maybe do this or do that. And if I do explain it to them, it doesn't make sense to them. It made sense to me. <laughs> You know, because I, I, I knew everything I was doing right or wrong, and I, you know, I didn't need somebody to, to harp on me every day about it. Because I, I, I knew, well, you know, I knew how to fix my, my stuff uh, internally in my head. So for me, the, the biggest part I can try to talk to kids, and, I, and if I do get asked, it's the mental part of the game. Because for me, that's that, that dominates any part of the game of anything physical. All these kids in this clubhouse are major league ball players, but are they major league ball players between their ears? 
And I think that's what uh, more people need to work on than actual uh, the physical part or the, or the playing part. I, th I think what he said is really what's missing in the game right now is is we are you know we've kind of moved on from big league guys coaching. You know we got minor league guys coaching, <coughs> and, and, and they're doing a great job. But I know when I came up, and I bet you these guys can say the same things. I learned from the big league guys and the big league coaches who were big league hitters. There, you just can't replace that. Yes, I, anybody can teach a swing. Anybody can can teach an exit speed or an exit velo or, or tell you what strikes this guy. But to actually manage this mind right here in a big league game, that's the most difficult thing. And that's the thing that gets you over the hump. And, and I don't know, we're all you got as far as Colorado's history, right? So. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it's important for every team to reach out to their ex-players or just ex-players, period, to come and give that back because that's been bad. That's, you just can't even, you can't put a, a, you can't quantify that kind of knowledge that these guys all have. Yeah, I think it's essential that an organization bring back some of their former players, uh, you know, just to have that knowledge. You get young minor league players or young major league players that uh, their first or second year in the big leagues all of a sudden they struggle. They never struggled before in the minor league. They struggle at this level. And like Dante and Larry said, the mental part, they're done. They don't know how to rebound from stuff like that. And they go into this little spiral all the way down. I can give you one case. I won't mention the player's name, but I was in a batting cage with him when I was with the Rockies. And we was working together. And uh, all of a sudden he asked me, uh, did you make it to the big leagues? I said, I got a couple of calls. <laughs> <laughs> and I, did. I said, you know, the next day he came back to me after Googling me, of course, and he's like, holy oh, shit, now I'm sorry I had to <laughs> It's just, you know, they don't know, but the thing about it, I think it's up to the organization to bring these guys back. Let them talk to, just walk around, let these kids just interact with them, talk to them about anything. It's not necessarily hitting, it could be on defense, it could be base running, it could be anything like that. But this organization is probably one of the only ones that, that I've been with that haven't done that. Most of the other teams that I've been, they bring guys back to do that. So yeah, I think it's essential. I think it's something very important that this <coughs> club needs to do. The, the hitting swing is so much different now too and what they're teaching because I, I, I coach Team Canada within the WBC every year and, and the only one that was doing anything right was Freddie Freeman because he's do it at old school. Old school. Right? You know, and, and right now they're these swings that they take in batting practice and off a tee in the cage. I'm uh, saying, what are you doing? The idea is not to hit the top of the roof, just hit, hit the end down there. <laughs> it's just it's it's tough to teach, but that's what they're being taught, and I don't know how to talk about that. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me. We got about ten minutes left here. So. Two big differences I think we've seen in the game since the playing days. One with the metrics that we have now and another with a lot of these new rules over the last couple of years. So the two part question is is there a metric that you particularly like or maybe have reevaluated your own career a lot of metric with? And secondarily, have there been any rule changes that you thought, man, I would like to have had that, or I'm glad that, I, that they didn't have that during my playing days? Yeah, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I, I actually love all the metrics. I love them all. We're just, I think we're using them wrong. Uh, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you this. This might be a little bit. Um, you know this whole pitch decisions. You know we're, we're we don't want you know we don't want anybody uh, swinging at anything other than right down the middle now, and that's great. If, and I think what an analytic guy would do is he would look at that and he would say, dang, if you just swing at that pitch down the middle, you hit 400. So why would you swing at anything else? Um, and they'll tell you get one of those every at bat. Now if I told Michael Jordan, hey, if, if you notice that when you shoot layups, you shoot at like 90 percent. Why don't you just shoot layups, you know? And don't practice that fadeaway jumper that won you six world championships. Just practice that layup. You know, that would work against teams that let it get to the basket, right? And that pitch down the middle will work against pitchers that throw it down the middle, right? But it, but, but analytics is driven to beat the average player. The above average guy, you know, uh, Garrett Cole is not giving you pitches down the middle every at bat. The below average guy probably give you two a pitch in that bat. And the average guy probably give you one. So it, it works, but I don't think it wins championships. So I just think the metrics are awesome. We just don't use them correctly. And the other thing, this, this, the, 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 uh, the new rule changes, I think the um, thrown over twice, I think they're just 
they're taking advantage of that because pitchers and that the pitchers will have this offseason the organizations will be on that they'll be trying to figure that out they'll probably figure it out to a point but i think they're taking advantage you see so many stolen bases so it's, that would be fun because we like to run back in the day well you know the thing about i love a lot of these rules that they implemented like you know of course the bigger bases and this and that they're trying to bring back athleticism that was taken away because of so much of the metrics and all this other stuff. So, you know, to take it away and just look at launching, you had guys five foot six, 150 pounds, launching the balls, trying to hit home runs. And that's not what, that's not your job, okay? You're not supposed to do that anyway. But all of a sudden they saw the numbers were so down. They had to do something to bring it back as far as the creation of, you know, Shift, no more shifting. Guys, are, the average league average was 230. Terrible. Okay, uh, make bigger bases. All of a sudden, it creates more athleticism. Guys have a chance to steal more. Okay, um, I mean, there's so many different things that they tried to do to bring back the athleticism, which I think was taken away initially because of all this stuff. Okay, so yeah, just play baseball. Hit run, but well, where is that? <laughs> That's like a dinosaur nowadays, right? You don't do it anymore. So, I mean, it's, the, the name of this game is to win. Outscore the opposing team any way possible. If that means dropping a bunt to get a guy over at second base, base it, but the metrics are saying, oh, well, that the percentages of that, no, I don't like that, but that's just me. You know, I've been old school, but I still like some of the changes, okay? All this stuff is resources, but you still have to play the game. I um, I'm a hybrid man. I like uh, I like a lot of new stuff, but I like the old school stuff too. But I uh, <clears throat> I think you still have to use your instincts. I mean the, the metrics there, all the analytics are there for you to use it and uh, get better too. But uh, you have to be you too. You have to have use your instincts, man. Uh, how big is your heart? How big is your gut? There's no not nobody measure that. So like I said, I, I love a lot of stuff. The new stuff, but I, I I love the old stuff too. I really old, old school like too. And the changes they made, the, the one I really like is the one they when they go over to see to, to make the right call. I like that one a lot because they uh, you see World Series lost because of that. So I I like that a lot because <coughs> every fan made the right call. Man, I'm not going to touch the analytics. I don't even understand. <laughs> I don't know what they stand for or what they mean or anything, so it's... it's <laughs> you know, you're OPS plus. I'm cl clueless on any of that stuff, I really am. And uh, uh, the rule changing, I'm, I'm glad the... I guess I'm, it's better that the shift isn't there, although in the, in the same breath, I can't figure out how hitters couldn't adapt and, and figure out how to hit a baseball the other way and, and take advantage of what they were given instead of just stick with the same stupid swing all the time that wasn't working. Made no sense to me. Um, and I, I'm not a fan of the... Uh, the, the extra innings, starting the guy on second. I, I hate that. You know, you go out there, you're battling your asses off for nine innings, and now you, all of a sudden you get a gift runner at second base. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather if they want to do it in the tenth inning, how about we start a runner at first base, not at second, or don't put the guy at second until maybe the eleventh or twelfth inning. You know, at least have a couple of innings to win it in normal baseball fashion. Don't you just have a home run derby? <laughs> you want to get the fans in there? Like a Well. You know, I, th the yeah. I think, um, you know, if, if we came back for the 100th anniversary, they'll still be talking about your era as a distinct era that will never be repeated, I don't think, in Rockets history. And part of that is, you know, the, the humidor and the, the fence elevated out there and things like that. But what's it in your mind, you know, to have to have been a part of that unique period of time and have that part of your legacy? What's your, you know, your, your, how do you come to terms with that as part of your... Like classic rock, right? Yeah, classic yeah. Classic rock doesn't <laughs> exist. If new music sucks, you know, like Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, The Who, you know, that doesn't exist no more. So we're a classic rock. I mean, we're the Blake Street Bombers, you know what yeah. I'm saying? I mean, that's really cool. That's probably my most famous thing about me, right? I was a Blake Street Bomber. And that's what people remember me at. I think it's cool to note too, and I think this is still true, we're the only team in history to steal 200 bags and hit 200 home runs. Yeah. That was a cool thing, I thought. So, yeah, that was a, that was a cool, cool team, man. And, uh, and the fans here love the Blake Street Bombers, so what you love never dies, man. 
For each one of you, your least favorite pitcher that you faced. Well, I go, I hate all pitchers. <laughs> but uh, if I'm going to go with the least favorite, I, I say the one that I did the worst against, I guess. So for me, I was 0 for 18 against Wally Whitehurst. So, <laughs> like Wally Whitehurst. <laughs> so my first game, <clears throat> can I tell the story? <laughs> my, um, I get to the big leagues and I'm, I'm platooning with Claudel Washington and I notice uh, Nolan Ryan's pitching and Claudel's a left-hander, he's probably playing it. And I read the newspaper and it had every strikeout that Nolan ever had in each player. And at the top of the list was Claudel Washington. <laughs> like 30 times he struck him out. I said, oh, I'm in the lineup today. But I was excited, I was a young kid. I was like, I can't wait, this is Nolan Ryan. I went out there, he was 45 or 46, still put on 110. <laughs> and, I, and I go and I get out there and I look out there and I'm like, oh, he, that's not him. And he looked like a young 25 year old and he had this big old butt on him, man. And I was like, he's just jacked, man. And um, then he took off his hat, he was bald. And it's like, oh, that's that's so Ryan. And I remember the first pitch he threw me, it was, you know, I was, I, I was a kid. I mean, Nolan Ryan, he, he threw 800. He didn't throw 100, he threw about 800 to, to a young kid, right? <laughs> I remember I was looking for this 800 mile an hour fastball and he threw a breaking ball. And it's the only time in my life I fell on my back. <laughs> and it was right down the middle. And it ended up not striking out. He took a no hitter into the seventh. I got a hit. I was one for three with no strikeouts. And I thought, I went in after that game and said, I can play in the big leagues because that's the greatest pitcher I think ever, the best stuff anyway. And I remember I ended up one for 11 with eight Ks on it. <laughs> 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 For me, the toughest guy I faced in, in my career is, was Pedro Martinez. I mean, he's, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, he had uh, 20 pitches, I think, right? <laughs> all, all those 20 pitches are above average. Man. So that, that was, uh, that was a, a tough day when, when you face a, a guy like Pedro Martinez. I think for me, it was Brent Saberhagen. <clears throat> my first game, I hit a homer against him and, and another hit. After that, I was over 18 with about 15 punch outs. So he made the adjustment and I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to go farther, no, this is like an 0 for 18, I did suck against him. But when you step in as far as knee knocking stuff, you know, I, I, Doc Gooden was no fun to step mm -hmm. in against, and uh, John Candelaria was no fun as a left hander stepping in against. Those are two that stick in your head as like, oh God, well, I got no chance. I hit Randy good. Randy good no, no, except no, for the game no, I didn't no, play no, against no, him. No, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.